We're starting with the top story in Ottawa. The NDP's deal with the Liberals is over. Despite Jagmeet Singh ripping up the agreement, the Prime Minister says the Liberals are still focused on governing. Hopefully the NDP will continue to try and deliver for Canadians. Right now they're focused on politics. We're focused on Canadians. Singh faced questions for the first time today about his decision to back out of the deal. So after two and a half years, why did Jagmeet Singh end this deal now? And is he prepared to launch the country into a federal election? Jagmeet Singh is the leader of the federal New Democratic Party, and he joins me now. Mr. Singh, welcome back to Power and Politics. Thanks so much. You keep saying that Prime Minister Justin Trudeau caves to corporate greed and won't do what needs to be done. Can you give me a specific example where you asked the Liberals to take action on corporate greed and they didn't do it? For food prices, for over two years, food prices exceeded general inflation, and we said we need to take action. The Liberals' action was to tell people, and they said this with a straight face, to look at grocery flyers. Champagne came out with that as a solution, that people need to be better at shopping. They then said they were going to go and ask the CEOs nicely to stabilize prices. None of that worked. Most recently, workers wanted to work strike for better work conditions, safer work conditions, which is actually not just for those workers, but for all Canadians when it comes to railway safety. And uh, they were locked out, so they didn't even get to go on strike. And then instead of allowing for a negotiation to happen at the table, the Liberals, Justin Trudeau, caved to corporate interest and forced binding arbitration, which undermined the workers' right to negotiate fairly and also rewarded bad behavior of corporations that in a lot of ways had some shady collusion in the timing of both the CN and CPKC uh, labor disputes happening around the same time, both undermining workers, both hurting workers. So many examples, but those are the right. two I can give you. Right well, well, let's just talk about food prices, because I know this has been something you've been talking about. You've been going after Galen Wesson. You've been going after grocery CEOs. Like, what's, like so? Uh, yes, food prices were higher than baseline inflation, because you had things like the war in Ukraine. You had avian flu driving up the price of chicken. You have climate change either causing flooding or drought in key agricultural sectors. I mean, what's the policy response to that from a government to, to drive down the prices profits. that you would have done? You also had record profits, that these companies weren't just making good profits at the same time of seeing Canadians have to pay more than ever at the grocery stores and leaving with less than ever. These same grocery stores posted the most profits they've ever seen. Right, but what's the and policy so response for a government to drive that. down the Other prices? Countries so we're talking at the same time. Oh, sorry, well, but, 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 but I'm trying to understand, like other, other countries ha also have food price challenges. So what is the policy response you asked them to do that they didn't do? This is what I'm struggling to understand. Uh, we said we needed to see some either force these companies to lower prices or impose uh, a excess profit tax. We then put forward a bill or a motion, a plan to say put in place price caps, something that France has done effectively and lower the price of over 5,000 essential food items. Other countries are taking this more seriously. There's been attempts to go after the excess profits that corporations are making in a way to curb some of the impacts on consumers, on people. They're feeling so squeezed, so hurt. And Justin Trudeau and the Liberals have ignored that. And so it's become very clear they're not interested in taking the steps necessary to tackle these serious problems. Corporate landlords are ripping off Canadians. There's so much more that can be done to protect consumers, protect Canadians, protect renters. And the Liberals refuse to do so. Okay, so what can they do on rent? Because rent is, is provincial jurisdiction. That's what runs uh, the rental uh, regulations, landlord tenants agencies. These are our provincial government powers and responsibilities. What is it you asked them to do on rent that they didn't do? Well, a significant number of corporate landlords take per federal money. They take federal money in the form of preferential tax treatment. They take it in the form of direct subsidies. They take it in the form um, of being having their loans backed by CMHC. We said that you should, not a cent of federal support should go to corporate landlords that rent evict their, their tenants, that mistreat their tenants, that jack up rents above, guide, above guideline increases. And I've met with many tenants uh, in Toronto and communities across the country where they are in a building that receives some of those forms of federal support and are being exploited and being ripped off. That's another tool. There are uh, many excuses if the federal government wants to find an excuse not to solve a problem. But I think leadership is not finding an excuse, it's finding a solution. And when it comes to these federal uh, supports being given to corporate landlords, that is a powerful tool to say, no, you're not going to give you a cent of federal support unless you follow these guidelines. Have some strings attached to the fact that CMHC backs uh, with insurance on loans that give these large corporate landlords the ability to buy more properties, 
Uh, right. These are tools that can be used, but they're not being used. Well, look, look there's disagreement on, on what exactly is driving the, the grocery store chain profits and whether the government can really put a cap on, on food prices and, and have a realistic effect. They've done and, it in other countries. Sure. Well, but they have different laws and they have different trade agreements. I mean, can you legally impose price caps on goods that come in from Mexico and the United States without triggering some sort of a trade dispute? We know that corporate grocery stores have their own in-house brands on essentials. There's lots of ways to find, if their goal is to find a solution, mm -hmm. there's solutions out there. If the goal is to say, yes, we're gonna take on corporate greed, they suggested to do something. They said they were gonna have a meeting with the CEOs. Well, why not threaten them with the uh, uh, excess profit tax? There's lots of tools. It's really about the will. And this is the problem with the liberals and Justin Trudeau. They're very quick to find excuses. There are a lot of solutions. If you wanna get things done and you are the prime minister of Canada, there are so many tools at your disposal to get things done. Okay. If you want to find excuses, yes, there's lots of excuses. Say, oh, I can't do this, I can't do that. But if you want solutions, you can find them. But, okay, just, just as a final point on this, if you wanted them to take action on food prices, you know, even though there's some disagreement on that, if you wanted them to do something on rent, even though that falls into provincial jurisdiction, why not make those conditions of the Supply and Confidence Agreement, try to renegotiate it, put it in there, and use the tool that you had to make that part of the agenda rather than walking out and, and, and losing that leverage play? Well, we've got a lot of things done, and I think it's important to point out we got a significant uh, number of things done that were a part of our agreement. The dental care program's out the door. It's being delivered. Seniors are getting it. Kids are getting it. It's a brand new program that we force the government to deliver. Pharmacare legislation is passed. Anti-scab legislation is passed. Some of the key pieces that we wanted to have done, the Sustainable Jobs Act is passed. We passed these pieces of legislation. Some of them we needed to see the rollout uh, into this summer, and we saw that with the dental care piece. And then it became very clear with the overwhelming amount of evidence that the Liberals are too weak, too beholden to corporate interests to do what's necessary to make people's lives better. And they show again and again more evidence of that. And they're also too weak and frankly similarly beholden to corporate interests to take on Pierre Polyev and the threat of conservative cuts. The next election is going to be a change election. Okay, people but are done with Justin Trudeau. So people are going to have to choose between Pierre Polyev and his vision of cutting and gutting the things that Canadians need or new Democrats who offer hope and investing in the solutions. But the deficiencies you're talking about now are not in the Supply and Confidence Agreement. They lived up to their side of the agreement, and now you're walking away without living up to your side of it, right? Of passing four budgets and, and maintaining stability in Parliament until June of 2025. I mean, they honored what they signed. Are you not breaking your word to them by walking away? It became clear that we had completed a significant part of our agreement, and that what we needed to see from Justin Trudeau and the Liberal Party was in the Liberal government was a lot more and they had were unwilling to do what was necessary given the uh, unprecedented inflation that people are going through the cost of living increase people are going through the lack of urgency the lack of any sort of real volition to want to make things better for people made it clear to me that we could no longer continue okay you, the language you used in the video in, in your statement and and here in this interview where you've referred to the liberals as too weak too selfish and too beholden to corporate interests i mean that is a critique of the fundamental character of this government i mean aren't they essentially the same people though and the same government that you signed the agreement with in march of 2022 i don't see dramatic change in who they are and how they function i mean explain this to me we saw a dramatic change in people's circumstances when we first embarked on this agreement uh, over two years ago, and we saw subsequently a massive increase in cost of living and a complete abject failure of Justin Trudeau and the Liberals to respond to that. They did not respond to food prices while acknowledging that it was a problem. You have to recall that they did come out and do press conference saying, okay, yes, it's a problem. You got to look at your food uh, flyers. You got to look at grocery flyers and look at the deals. Like That's an insulting thing to say to a family that's saying, we're, we're spending more than ever before on groceries and are leaving with less than ever before. And they hear from Justin Trudeau's government, one of their ministers saying, you got to do a better job of shopping around your flyers. Then they get this fake promise of we'll force them to stabilize prices by asking them nicely. I mean, this is all an acceptance of the problem, but a failure to do anything meaningful to address it. That became very clear, and we saw more and more examples of that. Well, well inflation... The people struggles that people are going through made it clear that this government and Justin Trudeau and the Liberals are not up to the challenges.
Okay, well, inflation is coming down now, and in some cases, food prices are deflating. They're actually decreasing. So, I mean, there has been some change in, in those circumstances as, as you're doing this. But if the I would say, though, the net increase, though, of like over, what, totally. 25, 30% increase of prices, even if inflation stabilizes, that doesn't address the fact that prices have gone up by that much. They've not come down by 30%. No, un, un, understood. But there are a lot of global inputs into the prices of, of a basket of food that, that we talked about earlier. But, but I wonder, Mr. Singh, if you say they are too weak, too selfish, to be holding the corporate interests. I know you've left the supply and confidence agreement. How can you vote confidence in future confidence votes in a government with these fundamental deficiencies? If I had an employee with those qualities and I had the chance to fire them, I'd do it. What are you going to do? We're going to take each vote as it comes. I'm not going to guess at, at what the vote is and, and guess at my vote at it. Uh, we'll take each vote as it comes and make our decision. But what is clear is what we are up against now is an election that will happen because I've torn up this agreement at a date that's now more uncertain. But that election is going to be about who can replace this government. And it's a choice between Pierre Polyev, who wants to cut the things that Canadians need, been very open about wanting to cut people's pensions, one of the first things he announced in 2022, so he wants to cut people's pensions, or New Democrats who want to strengthen someone's pension and ensure that we make life better for people. Okay, I, I do want to talk about the election in just a second, but I want a little bit more insight, if I can, into the timeline of how you made this decision. Because this video the announcing it was released yesterday, and you know, you've gotten some criticism for doing this days after Mr. Polyev suggested you should tear up the agreement, but the video itself was recorded weeks ago, uh, I'm told, at least a week and a half, maybe close to a month ago. So it was done well in advance of anything Mr. Polyev said. When precisely did you make the decision to pull the plug on the supply and confidence agreement? Well, we've been having ongoing discussions about this for, for a while now in, in caucus amongst my team. and something that's not something that uh, it was a, a last minute decision that we just woke up and decided. It's something we've been thinking about. Uh, we were looking at things that we wanted to get done. We wanted to make sure that dental care, a uh, big chunk of it was completed and, and we wanted to make sure that things had been passed and out the door. And so we've been reflecting on this for a while. And as you mentioned, yes, the video was shot uh, close to a month ago, so well before uh, Paul Yev's recent letter. And let me be really clear, I will never listen to the advice of Pierre Paul Yev, someone who wants to destroy our healthcare system, someone who wants to get rid of and uh, destroy pensions, someone that wants to let his corporate buddies uh, have a, a, a feast at, at the troughs when it comes to ripping off Canadians. Like, I'm never going to listen to a guy like that, someone who wants to let his buddies rip off Canadians at grocery stores and, and when it comes to corporate landlords. That's not someone I'm ever going to take advice from. Okay, so you made the decision, what, in July, in June? Like, when, when was the actual decision point made? And then let's go shoot a video to be ready to announce it to the world. Uh, I can tell you that we made this decision over, over lots of reflection. And the decision was announced yesterday. We, we torn up the agreement. And now uh, we've made it very clear that we are going to go vote to vote. And this sets up a question about the election. We know that means the election more probable than before. Before it was less probable, now it's more likely. And we're ready for that. And the choices for Canadians are in front of them. Conservatives under Pierre Polyev mm -hmm. who want to cut the things that you need. New Democrats who want to build up our country. That's going to be the choice in the next election. But if the decision had been made uh, quite some time ago, to the point that you were able to shoot a video and do video production, wasn't this worth a phone call to the prime minister that you've worked with for the last two and a half years on this to deliver things like dental care? Like, why didn't you pick up the phone and call Justin Trudeau and say, hey, we have to talk about this because I'm going to fundamentally change the, the political stability and the political landscape of the country? I mean, isn't it worth a phone call when you've been working together for two years? Uh, we don't want to leave a door open to any new deal. There's no new deal here. This is the deal is done and ripped it up and we're moving forward. And so I don't want to open up the door to a potential negotiation or any future deal. The deal is done. We're going to go vote to vote and we're going to continue to fight for Canadians and we're going to bring that choice to Canadians. They've got a choice coming up and it's going to be about who replaces this government. And that choice is between at the federal level, you got conservatives want to cut with Pierre Polyev or you got new Democrats, you got me, who's going to fight for working people. Okay. That's a choice. But you've now, as you've acknowledged, created the conditions for an early election, right? And, and this favors the Conservatives, would be the analysis that I, I would have, in that they have the big lead, they have the big war chest, and this is the very party that you are saying today represents a threat to the well-being of Canadians, and you have just created the circumstances where they can get their path to power much sooner, much quicker, and before you're in a position to stop them. It's going to be a fight. I'm not suggesting this is easy in any ways. There's a big fight for the future of our country, and, and we have a really serious job in front of us. 
Canadians need to know what they already know about conservatives, and they need to know that the Pierre Polyev is serious about it. He and his, his team talk regularly about dismantling the Canada healthcare system. They want to do that. They do not want to see a public health care system anymore. They want to see people paying money out of pocket privately to get care. I think that is fundamentally wrong. Generations of Canadians have fought to have a health care system where it should not matter how much money you earn to determine the quality of care you get or how quickly you get that care. That is something that Pierre Polyev is opposed to. That is a fundamental difference of opinion for the future of our country. We're going to take that to Canadians. He wants to cut pensions. They did it when Harper was in power. Pierre Polyev announced it right when he became leader. He said that EI and pensions or payroll taxes, he would cut them. That means he wants to cut people's pensions. He's been very open about it. That's a cho choice I want to put to Canadians. Do you want to let Pierre Polyev cut your pensions or do you want new Democrats to strengthen your pensions? But the criticism, the criticism response from the Liberals yesterday was that you're doing this for your own political benefit and, and that it's hard to differentiate yourself, I guess, from a, a Liberal government that you've been working with, sort of you've been the Robin to Justin Trudeau's Batman, and that you're doing this to differentiate and pivot and create a chance to do contrast and, 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 and offer change. I mean, that this is purely a political decision for your self-interest because they were living up to the letter of the deal and doing everything that they said they would do. How do you respond to what they said? Uh, it became clear that people needed a lot more. Uh, we went through unprecedented cost of living increases, and those are really serious pro challenges. And it, it became also clear again and again that when push came to shove, Justin Trudeau and the Liberals chose to side with the folks that are ripping off Canadians. They chose to side with the big corporate grocery stores. They chose to side with the big corporate landlords. They did not use the tools they had at their disposal to fight against these serious challenges that people are going through. And that made it clear to us we couldn't continue. Uh, Mr. Polyev has criticized you. He's called you sellout Singh. He's called you stuntman. Singh uh, for doing uh, what he suggested you should do in terms of tearing up the deal. But uh, you're now saying you're going to go vote by vote. Uh, you're not saying you're going to bring down the government. I mean, do you still have any confidence in this government whatsoever after working with them for two and a half years? Do you have any confidence? We're going to make a decision based on what's in front of us. I wouldn't say to you I'm going to decide on a vote that hasn't actually been presented. I'm going to look at it and assess, is it something in the interest of Canadians? And make a decision that way. Uh, but on Pierre Polyev, let's, let's be really clear. This is a guy with a silly notion of having alliteration as his strategy, with, mm -hmm. with buzzword slogans, thinking that that is how you run a country. I mean, it's silly and, and frankly, it, it's petty. And what, what he knows is that he is lying to Canadians. He knows that we fought and forced Justin Trudeau to do things they would never have done, bring in dental care to change the lives of millions of Canadians. Right. That's what we did. He knows that. Uh, so he's lying knowingly, but he's doing it because he wants to distract from Canadians that what he wants to do is destroy dental care. So for seniors out there, for parents and grandparents that are getting it, he doesn't think they deserve to have dental care. He doesn't think kids deserve to have dental right. care, despite the fact that taxpayers have been paying for his dental care since most of his adult life. He doesn't think that people deserve it. He also wants to dismantle right. our entire health care system. That's what he's distracting from when he does these lies and these petty things. But, but the Conservatives are a threat to cut everything that Canadians hold dear, in your view, and the Liberals are a threat to keep selling out to corporate interests, uh, in your view. The Liberals have been hammered by Corporate Canada for their capital gains tax increase, windfall taxes on insurance and financial institutions, oil and gas emissions cap, digital services tax, which is uh, putting us into a collision course as a country w with the United States, potentially. They brought in a minimum tax uh, on the wealthy uh, to avoid them, to make it harder for them to use deductions. Uh, to get around paying tax. I mean, that is not a pro-corporate agenda, a pro-wealthy agenda, as you're defining them. When it comes down to it, though, when push comes to shove, on the two most fundamental things that Canadians care about, cost of their groceries, cost of their rent, on those two fundamental things, they've caved heavily to corporate interests. They threatened to bring in an uh, excess profit tax. They didn't do it. They didn't actually get any real results on lowering prices. They knew that this was a problem. They accepted it. And we pushed for changes, and they backed away, and they backed down because they caved to the corporate interest on grocery prices. And that's something that affects people on a regular basis. That's your weekly bill. People are worried about something that's affecting them regularly, and Justin Schroeder and the Liberals fail to respond to that. Okay, just on top of that, when it comes to the rent, that's something you have to pay monthly. That's a serious thing. And we've got corporate landlords in Canada receiving either CMHC-backed insurance on their loans or getting preferential tax treatment or getting straight-up federal money 
and not uh, and mistreating their tenants. Right, but the, the, the government could have done something about it. They didn't. The, I mean, look, the rent challenges are bigger than just corporate landlords, though they are a part of it, and it is provincial jurisdiction. So there are limits in, in, in what you want them to do there. But because uh, what I've described isn't a, isn't provincial jurisdiction. I'm just saying. No, but it may it may not be enough to solve the, the problems that rip off people. Right. Well, look, as, as a final question, you, you're framing the election now as a choice between you and, and Mr. Polyev, and that we don't know when the next election is going to be, but we know when the by-election in Elmwood Transcona is going to be. That's on September 16th. That is an NDP seat. The Blakeys have held that. Daniel Blakey left to go back and work for Wab Canoe and put this seat into play. Conservatives have a chance to win this. Uh, if you lose that seat to the Conservatives, are you really the credible alternative to Pierre Polyev? Right now, people in that by-election have a choice. And, and that's an important choice. I'm going to continue to put that choice to the people at Elmwood Transcona. I'm actually headed there uh, in a day. I'll be there tomorrow. And folks are going to have a choice in that by-election. Do they want to support the conservative cuts of Pierre Polyev? They rejected that in Manitoba. But what if they Manitoba vote for it? What recently. if they vote for it? What if they say yes? What if they vote for the conservative agenda and not for your agenda after you have defined the choice Canadians are facing in these stark terms? What does that tell you about this move? Well, I'm not going to answer hypothetical. We don't know the outcome of that election until it happens. But I can tell you what I'm going to do right now. I'm going to go to Manitoba. I'm going to Winnipeg. Like I said, tomorrow I'll be there. And I'll be sharing with folks our vision, our vision of a hopeful Canada, one where we lift each other up, where we take care of one another. And I'm going to contrast that with Pierre's vision, Pierre Polyev's vision, which is to tear down Canada, tear down our health care, tear, tear down and cut our pensions, tear down the things that Canadians believe in. That's the choice in this next election, and, and it's the choice in this by-election. Jagmeet Singh, federal NDP leader, thank you for your time today, sir. Thank you. Okay, we're going to bring in the power panel now to talk about all of this. Cameron Amott is a former head of communications to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Andrew Thompson is a former Saskatchewan NDP cabinet minister. James Moore is a former federal conservative cabinet minister. And Shachi Curl is the president of the Angus Reid Institute. Uh, it's good to see you all, gang. Uh, thank you for not ripping up your deal with us and being here on Thursday. Andrew, uh, we saw the 90-second video yesterday from Jagmeet Singh. Today we got a repetitive but more fulsome explanation. Did he make a better case? for his decision, do you think? I think he's starting to make the, the argument. It's going to take some time for, for them to get their identity back as a, you know, a, a true opposition party, which is obviously what they're wanting to do. I think they've been hearing clearly on the, the doorsteps in the by-election that it's hard to campaign a government against a government that you're propping up. Mm. And that they need to have that, uh, if they're going to have the you know, support that they need to, to grow, they've got to identify themselves as something other than the Liberals. And I think that's uh, the message that Singh was, is working to get out now. And uh, that's why I don't believe that the government's going to be falling anytime uh, uh, too soon. I expect that they'll be around uh, probably well into the spring because the NDP is going to need time to get that definition out there. James, do they really gain the differentiation they seem to be seeking if they still vote with the government on confidence motions to continue to implement the still lingering elements of the supply and confidence agreement? No. Um, everything Andrew said is correct about where the NDP wants to be, but the incoherence um, and the intellectual twisting that Jagmeet Singh has to do in order to try to appear to be independent of liberals, and what he said today is just so mindless, and it makes one's head hurt. You know, he's gonna he's gonna clearly go out and brag about. All, all the achievements of this agreement, the achievement, the, the the supply and confidence agreement was great. We got all these things done. It's really wonderful. Um, but you can't trust the Liberals. Even though the Liberals delivered six out of the seven votes, they have 154 seats to the NDP's 24. They delivered six out of the seven votes for all the things that the NDP are very proud of. But you just can't trust those Liberals. Okay, so you can't trust the Liberals. So you're going to vote against the Liberals? Well, we'll take it on a case-by-case -case basis. But I thought you said you don't trust the Liberals. Well, you can't trust the Liberals because they're all for corporate greed and we just can't trust them. So you're going to vote to bring them down? Well, we'll take it on a case-by-case -case basis. I mean, what is it? Was the confidence and supply agreement a success for which you have to share some credit with the Liberals? Or was it a miserable failure, in which case you can't trust the Liberals and therefore you're going to bring them down, in which case he's going to take it on a case-by-case -case basis? The incoherence of Jagmeet Singh and his incapacity to be clear about what has been accomplished over the last two years and to, and to weave together a coherent message is staggering. It's staggering that this guy is a leader of a political party. Okay, uh, so, so Cameron will put James down as undecided. Uh, I, I'm just wondering where you think this leaves the Liberals right now, because they have lost their governing partner uh, as they head into caucus and as Parliament is set to resume with a couple of by-elections uh, all at the same time. Yeah, it, it leaves the Liberals, I think, on a practical level in a tough spot, because going into the parliamentary session, it means that this minority government is going to be 
back to a, a more chaotic uh, system to get mm -hmm. their bills passed and to, to actually govern. You know, you had some certainty over the past two years, despite everything the NDP was saying, being extremely critical of the government constantly, despite being in a deal with them and propping them up. It provided that certainty on a practical level. It meant that you could actually try and get things done in Parliament. You had a clear path of what type of priorities you're going to try to implement. So it does create some difficulty for them. It also creates some opportunity, I think, because now the messages are going to have to sharpen. I agree with James entirely that there's no coherence in how the NDP ex tried to explain this. Like, it really doesn't make sense if you're just watching and trying to understand why now you're not calling an election, but you're saying that you've, this has been great, but also the Liberals are terrible and you've suddenly realized that they're corporate uh, sellouts. So that all doesn't make sense. But regardless, they're going. Every party now is going to have to sharpen their message heading into whenever the next election comes. So they have to. The Liberals absolutely have to cement themselves as the progressive alternative to the Conservatives and say, "Look, we figured out a way to work with the NDP. We figured out how to make this minority parliament work for the middle class, for working people. Here are all the amazing things we've got done." The NDP doesn't. They don't have any plan. They don't really have any pathway to delivering for Canadians because they had one and they've backed out of it now. So, Shachi, um, w w you know, I think it's easy to see why the NDP want to separate themselves from, you know, the, the, the Liberal brand at this point so they can offer some contrast and a choice in the next election. How do you think voters are going to react to this? And, like, if you listen to the criticism of incoherence of reasoning and message, how does that, what's the first impression and how does that move things for the NDP? Well, beyond the first impression, the first thing that one of us needs to do on this panel is order Mr. Singh a shredder. Like, why is he doing so much ripping? Just, you know, shred <laughs> the agreement. Do not rip it up. That's too much work. It's only four pages, right. by the way. So, you know. but, but it's, it's just, you know, they have really fancy confetti cut ones now. Like, it's, come on. Anyway, um, look, in terms of the, the potential bounce uh, for the NDP, let's put things into some context. In the last three years, the, the conservative trend line has only gone one way. That's up mm -hmm. by 14 points. The liberal trend line has only gone one way, and that's down by 14 points. You've seen almost a one-for-one -one migration of liberal voters over to the conservative camp. You would think that progressive voters who don't want to vote liberal again would have found a home or thought about uh, voting NDP. But let me tell you something about the trend line for the NDP in the last three years. It has remained flat. In the meantime, you've got uh, the NDP not not only um, in a situation where they've, they've failed to pick up any traction or momentum, they are getting hammered by the Conservatives on uh, the play for working class voters, for union members, particularly private sector union members. And so this, this divorce, if you will, this file for separation uh, had as much to do with trying to put some distance. But the extent to which, you know, we, we heard that, that 90-second montage of, of uh, his reasons for leaving, uh, if he can't clearly articulate them on day two of why he's made that decision, uh, you know, Canadians, they're dealing with a lot of noise. Mm. I, I question how many actually know that much about the confidence and supply agreement. They know the Liberals are in charge, obviously, and they know for many of them they'd, they'd like to do something about that. But the details of it, the substance of it, the policy of it, and the way it's going to work. I know political watchers are going to be so excited in the coming months with every bloody confidence vote, but guess what? Uh, for the most part, Canadians are trying to live their lives, deal with cost of living, deal with housing affordability, and, and that's the punch through. That is what yeah. uh, what the NDP needs to make the case around. Yeah, I, I don't know how excited anybody is about the uh, trumped up drama of confidence votes that we're going to see, potentially. Uh, we'll, we'll see. I mean, maybe the government falls, maybe it doesn't, but I think you, you, there is going to be some... Uh, high drama uh, happening throughout the fall. But look, one of the things the NDP were saying today is that they're in really good financial shape. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why they can do this and get ready for an election, saying they're ready to fight uh, the, the next election. The Liberals have done a fundraising blast off of this. I want to show you the latest filings for Elections Canada, just to give you a sense of what the numbers look like. Look at where the Conservatives are, right? Uh, $20.5 million raised uh, so far this year, $6.8 million for the Liberals way back, just $2.6 million for the NDP and $665,000 for the Bloc Québécois who don't really need to run a national campaign. So when you look at the gap there, uh, Andrew, and you listen to what Jagmeet Singh has said in the video, like, 
criticizing the liberals for being weak and selfish and all of these things, but then trying to define the next election as a choice between Prime Minister Singh and Prime Minister Polyev. When you look at the polls, when you look at the math, you look at the rhetoric, you look at the money, how does that work? Well, look, it's going to be a three-way fight, and I don't understand why the NDP has decided to try to make this binary fight again. It, it never works for them when they do it. They open themselves up to the strategic voting argument of the Liberals. But one of the things that is different about this election for the Liberals, and it's to the, the point that was just made, is that about 15% of the electorate is parked with the Conservatives. Why? Because they do not like Justin Trudeau. Mm. They were Liberal voters, or they were NDP voters, who do not like Justin Trudeau. That makes them accessible to an opposition or to a renewed Liberal Party that is not tied up with Justin Trudeau. And that's what the NDP is trying to do, is they are trying to move three or four or five percent of that vote over into their column because they do not want a Conservative government. They do not want to see all of the work that they've done over the last three years become undone. And so this is really what's driving it, is figuring out how to take that block of voters that is mobile right now, parked with the Conservatives, and bring that down. There's only two ways to do that. The NDP needs to act like an official opposition, and the Liberals, if they want to reclaim some of that, need to change their leader. That's the calculus right now, and there's no way to really kind of move around it. That's, a, I think, the, the play, and uh, what Singh's got to do is find a better way to explain uh, how he's, in fact, stepping up to protect a progressive legacy uh, in that context. But, you know, James, um, the, the Liberal hope has always been that time would be on their side. They had a runway till October of 25, interest rate cuts, improving economic conditions, more spotlight and scrutiny on Pierre Polyev might change things for them a little bit. That all got more fraught today. It seems like what the NDP has done here is a gift to the Conservatives because it probably accelerates the election timeline for them. Uh, conceivably, another thing that I think hasn't been mentioned in the coverage that I've seen about yesterday's events is that sometimes parliaments actually get into a crisis and fall by accident. Yes. Not everything is by yes. design. And confidence votes can happen on a, on a spur of the moment thing by an amendment that wasn't assumed or a poison pill put in by a government or a, or you get my point. And so, you know, it, it does make things a little bit more precarious going forward for sure, which kind of, again, brings back to the NDP and their strategy in this. You know, you would think that they would say, Supply confidence agreement 1.0 worked, but we're going to raise the game because things are so important. So what we're going to do is we're going to have, how about any any federally man, federally regulated workplace, we want to have a guaranteed mandatory minimum wage of at least $25 or guaranteed minim, mandatory minimum income for all Canadians. But something that sets the bar on the progressive side really, really high in such a way that the Liberals would have to reject. Hmm. Instead, what they've done is they've taken themselves out of that, and now the Liberals can come forward conceivably in a in a in a budget next year and really tilt hard to the progressive left in a way that'll leave the NDP either voting confidence in the Liberals and therefore subsuming this whole argument that Jagmeet Singh's put forward in the last 24 hours, or giving the Liberals the votes they need to get it done and claim victory independent of the NDP's pressure. So here we are. This is so it's it's all very strange what they've done here. A second thing I would mention very quickly is that. Because things will be more conceivably precarious, not necessarily because of design, but because accidents happen in, in parliaments, they really do, mm. is that I think this will hasten the conversation by a lot of people, not just Jeremy Broadhurst on the, on the party side, but a lot of cabinet ministers who thought that they had until the spring of next year, or the summer of next year, to decide whether or not to run again. They're going to be start making the, having those conversations this weekend. They're going to have those conversations around Thanksgiving. And I think you could start seeing a lot of backbenchers and cabinet ministers make the decision to pull the plug now as opposed to waiting through Christmas in the spring. And that'll put more pressure on Justin Trudeau to make his own decision. Well, there have been some departures in the chief of staff ranks uh, in the government. And, and Cameron, I do want to ask you about Jeremy Broadhurst, who is was handpicked to run the next election campaign. Uh, he was a senior advisor for the prime minister, ran, the, I think he was a national campaign director in 2015, which was the big majority win. Here he is leaving a year out. I, I know that there is time to find someone, but there's been no replacement named. Governing partner gone, campaign manager stepping down, um, where does this, what do they do? <laughs> what a question. <laughs> uh, this is a tough blow for the party and, and the team, I think, because, uh, and I'll just say, as someone who's worked closely with Jeremy for a long time in different capacities, both at the party and in government, he's a great guy. He's uh, an extremely smart and brilliant um, political mind and a, just a wonderful person to work with. And he's devoted a lot of his life to <clears throat> to politics and to serving the country. So I think he'll you'll only hear praise from people like me who've worked with him and people in the party, and uh, deservedly so. Uh, in terms of what they do next, I mean, they do have to they have to act fast. They have to pick someone who has 
his degree of skill and experience, which is going to be hard to find mm -hmm. to take up that to take up that role. Um, and I think it's a really tough time, especially, I mean, you know, these are never easy announcements to make, right? There's, there's never a great way to announce something like this, uh, especially when there's so much else going on and the polling is what it is. Um, but we have to look forward. The party has to look forward. And as you mentioned, caucus meeting coming up, by-elections coming up very soon. Uh, this is a fraught moment for the party and the government and a tough time for them to, to, to muddle through, especially with parliament returning and... Mm -hmm as we've all talked about, a much more chaotic, unpredictable, difficult scenario, where, as James rightly mentioned, uh, mistakes can be made and uh, unpredictability truly will govern this parliamentary session. But, you know, Shachi, James talked about the prime minister can make his own decisions. Right now, the decision appears to be made that he's going to run again. And Andrew talked about how you can change the dynamic of the election by changing the leader. With the uncertain, unstable nature of parliament facing everybody in the fall, how do you even contemplate pushing for a leadership move of some sort? This seems to make it even less likely, and I thought he was never going to go, but that, that, that Justin Trudeau would think about leaving under these circumstances. Well, it, it would be the ultimate, frankly, if he were to go at this stage, middle finger to what is left of his base, his caucus, his cabinet, and the people who have stayed true under his tent. He can't go now. Uh, it makes no sense to go now. They have much bigger problems right in front of them, two inches from their nose, uh, than trying to figure out who another leader is. Look, sometimes... And I, I know I haven't been part of your discussions through the summer, but I'm back. I'm back. And, and so I'll, I'll tread a little <laughs> bit of ground that you've probably already talked about. Go right about. ahead. But yeah, I'm going to. Uh, you know, we're going to talk about some of these. The, the idea that, 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 you know, like Biden, if he just left, this would bring new energy back into the campaign. This is much more like what we saw in the UK, where just uh, the writing on the wall was there for the better part of two years. And, uh, you know, barring really something very dramatic happening, not just within the Liberal camp, but within the opposition camps, because this, this is going to be uh, a very much a, a change ballot question election. There is no point at this stage to Mr. Trudeau leaving. He has an opportunity now to think about legacy. He has an opportunity now to think about preserving dignity and, and about finishing out the policy things that he wants to do uh, for as long as the time that he's got to do it. The party branded itself around this leader. Justin Trudeau is the Liberal Party. The Liberal Party is Justin Trudeau. It was going to be challenging to change that six months ago, a year ago. It's certainly going to be challenging, if not impossible, to do that now. Andrew, how do you see it? I mean, how do you introduce even more volatility into this mix? Well, I mean, a couple of things. First of all, if they do decide to change leaders, one of the things that, that buys them is some time. There's no way the NDP is going to tank a, a party that's in the middle of a leadership fight. I think they'll wait for that to play out. Plus, there's lots of time in the parliament, to, you know, before a budget, uh, to for them to be able to change it. What we're missing here is going back to the numbers. And when you look at conservative voters today, at 40% of the electorate that's with the Tories, 40% of that, so 16% of the electorate, is there because they do not like Justin Trudeau. They are voting not because they like Pierre Polyev, not because they like the conservative agenda, because they do not like Justin Trudeau. That's a huge amount of the electorate that is available either to the Liberals under some a different leader or available to the NDP as a, 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 an alternative to uh, Trudeau and the Liberals. That's the, the issue. And so we can talk about, you know, whether it's messy, whether the NDP have the right argument or not. That's ultimately what it comes down to is who's getting that block of votes. And right now, it's Pierre Polyev. And Pierre Polyev has been smart about how to position it, and the Liberals and the NDP have played into it. They've got to spend the next six months changing that uh, that equation, changing that dynamic, and changing that ballot question. James, you carve out the electoral pie the same way as Andrew there, with, with, with the math he did there? Um, not necessarily, because issues will shift and, and, and circumstances will shift, you know, whether it's Bank of Canada rate. And also, politics in the United States will have a consequence on this side of the border as well, and mm -hmm. Canadians will assess who the president of the United States is and who they'd like to have juxtaposed to that. Jagmeet Singh, you know, he's now in an impossible position with the NDP to capture the votes that Andrew describes because he says, confidence supply agreement was great, we got all these things done, but it was so great, I'm tearing it up. And they say, well, the Liberals can't be trusted, but they can't be trusted so much that I'm going to trust them on a case-by-case -case basis. Well, what is, like, it's, so so if you're, if you want change and you want a different direction for the country, and that's the biggest voting cohort, is people who are unsatisfied with the status quo of Canada, 
not un unsatisfied with the status quo of liberals or st status quo of Justin Trudeau. They're unsatisfied with where the mm. country is and how they see themselves in the country. And if that's the case, then anybody who's been part of this current regime is going to be suffering at the polls in the next campaign. And all of that is to the advantage of Pierre Polyev. And he knows, I think, the messaging that's necessary to capture those voters. Andrew, quick rebuttal there. Look, it doesn't work that way because you may have 60 or 70 percent that aren't happy with the direction, but some of that is in fact currently parked with the NDP and will continue to be parked with the NDP. Those people that want a progressive future, those people that want more investment, not cuts, that don't want the austerity, that want to continue to see an investment in pharmacare and dental care and all those other programs that the Tories are saying that they won't invest in. That's where the schism well, becomes, that's and that's what uh, you know, where the Polyev Singh campaign, the difference of opinions come in. Is there a room for the Liberals up the middle? Of course, there always is. They managed to find that. <laughs> You know, uh, their history of and, and work at almost every election. Okay, James and then Shachi, you wanted to say something back, James. Well, I was just going to say voters set priorities. They don't say, I want a progressive government from tip to toe. They can prioritize mm -hmm. their issues. They can say, my number one issue is cost of living. And I think the remedy for that is getting rid of the carbon tax or lowering sure. lowering government mm -hmm. spending. Or my number one priority is schools and, and needles and, and ex excessive um, tolerance about um, social dysfunction. And that's my It's not I, progressive or conservative, one or the other, hold us both. List, you can prioritize. And if you look at the priority of issues of concerns for the public and the, and the corresponding remedy, the conservatives have lined themselves up very nicely in terms of the voters' yeah. appetites. Okay. okay. Shachi, right. uh, hop on in here. Yeah. Um, you know, Andrew's math works as long as we assume that voters, all of these voters, are totally malleable and may shift and may continue to move back and forth. Of course, it's their prerogative yeah. to do so right up until ballot day. But here's the thing. Conservative voters are the most likely of any of these party bases to say, I am absolutely certain about my vote. I am certain I will not change my mind. And that is the bankable support that the conservatives have at the moment in terms of the polling. But so, Shachi, just on that, uh, it seems to me the play by the other parties is not so much about necessarily winning government next time around, but stopping a majority. Is there enough malleability in the, the voting uh, intentions for that? I mean, sure, and and it becomes the new cri de cur. It becomes the new battle cry, or or the thing that motivates not only their base but maybe moves a few voters. Hey, we get it. We know you're mad. It looks like they're going to form government, uh, but let's hold them to a minority. Let's not hand them not only the keys to the car but the house and the bank vault at the same time. Again, the Conservatives in the in Britain in the UK tried that in the dying throes mm. of their campaign. It did not work. Let's see if uh, the extent to which. But you, that is a very psychologically tough decision and, and message to start delivering. It means that you're yeah. acknowledging it's done. I don't think the Liberals are there yet. Well, they, they were talking about a supermajority, stop a supermajority, and, yeah. and trying to make Keir Starmer scary, which I think is a very difficult proposition <laughs> in, in, in UK <laughs> politics. But Cameron, you go back to the set of issues that you know uh, James and others have spelled out there, and, and you listen to Jagmeet Singh talk about things like rent, for example. How does a government like the Liberals at the situation they find themselves in now respond to some of those policy challenges when many of them aren't in their jurisdiction and they were counting on getting a fourth budget through and they don't know if that's going to happen necessarily right now? So is there a way for you to respond to some of these to at least put yourself back in the game on the front there? Yeah, I, I mean, there's two things. Firstly, I think what the Liberals have not managed to do yet, which is critical every time you have you face a new leader, is you have to define your opposition. You have right. to define what's at stake. And they haven't managed to do that. Um, and I mean, yes, there still is time to do that. And I think if they manage to do that effectively, that's probably what can change their fortunes the most. But they spent uh, nothing on ads, Cameron. Leader. This is something liberals yeah. should talk to uh, describe this as basic malpractice. And I know we showed the fundraising numbers, and I know there's a massive numerical advantage here for the conservatives, but almost nothing has been spent sort of like targeting Polyev. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, there are a lot of strategic considerations in terms of when you want to place ads, uh, mm. whether it's more strategic to do so earlier on or closer to an election. Um, but I think that's definitely a, a good question to ask. I think regardless, you can, you know, the government has a large pulpit, ads or no ads. I mean, they're covered every single day. The prime minister does events every single day. He has a, the, the biggest team of, of, every, of any party. Um, so that has to be a focus and they have to put, they have to try some new things, but the time is running out for that. And the second thing to the question about the issues is maybe if there is any opportunity here 
as we enter this new parliamentary session for the Liberals, it's to try and rise above all of the politics. There's so much focus on cover and coverage right now on personalities, leadership questions, internal party stuff, and that will only increase as Parliament comes in and there are questions about confidence votes. The vast majority of Canadians, they don't really tune into those things and they mm. certainly, those those types of topics and that type of coverage certainly doesn't address their day-to-day -day, like kitchen table concerns. So who, which party is going to manage, which party other than the Conservatives, who managed to do it well so far, is going to manage to talk about those things that matter to people in their lives and be able to rise above uh, all of these other types of topics that don't really matter to the average yeah. person. You know, I do agree with Cameron on this question of tone, that I do think that that is a potential differentiator coming up, and it is something that plays to the Liberals' favour. The rage farming that we've seen from the Conservatives, this uh, new approach from the NDP, a lot of people just right now want to hear that they're going to have a competent, quiet government that does the things they want. Getting those three pieces to line up is really hard, because it doesn't all seem to live in one party. But that, I think, is an opportunity is to, to deal with that tone, bring back that sense of optimism, show a degree of con uh, competence uh, that could play the Liberals' advantage. But I'm not sure that any of that breaks through as long as they've got the current leader, which is what the litmus test of politics is about. James, do you, do you think it is about striking that elevated tone? I don't know. Like, I remember when Michelle Obama famously said, when they go low, we go high, and then they got creamed. And then at the Democratic <laughs> Convention this year, Michelle Obama put on her brass knuckles. You know, it was a very different approach to things. It feels like that's just where politics is right now. Well, there's a political, you know, there, there's a default political mindset in Canada for peace, order, and good government. But that gets rotated out of the mindset of the public when the public is angry, and the public's angry. And if the government comes along, yeah. and, if, and if they're competent and calm-headed and, and even keeled in their approach, you know, the, it, it's a responsibility in politics to mirror the emotions of the electorate, not to get ahead of them, not to fall behind them, but to make sure that the public understands that right. you hear them, that you empathize with them, you sympathize with them, and that you've got remedies to their concerns and their aggravations. And if the government's kind of going along saying everything is great, well, they've been doing that for the past two years and they've been steered straight into a ditch as a consequence. The public's angry frustrated. They don't know that their kids can never buy a home. They don't know that they can afford their own retirement. They're worried about their next set of groceries and what it's going to mean for their bottom line. They're angry about that. And they're looking for some scapegoats and they're looking for some solutions. And if the government just kind of is going along as sort of a happy warrior, that doesn't reflect the anger of the public. They want the government to get into business, but they want to let the, the government to reflect their energy as well. Okay, um, we are out of time. I want to thank you all. It's good to have you back. It's good to see you all again. It's good to be back in the chair talking to you smart folks who know more things uh, than I do. Cameron Abad, James Moore, Andrew Thompson, Shachi Curl, thank you so much, gang. Thanks, David.